Thank you very much. Thank you, Russell. Uh, if any of you haven't read Russell's book on uh, New Amsterdam, you should. Um, it was invaluable in my research, and uh, you know, it's it's one of those moments in history that uh, um, seems to to get missed and often forgotten. So it was a real service to have done it. Um, I I'm not completely new to uh, Amsterdam. I've, I've been here often in the past, although I find myself in the odd position of uh, being uh, up here promoting a book whose title I can't pronounce. Um, I, um, I, I have to say, Russell, that I really agree about the, uh, the herring. Uh, that, that, that is the, the finest moment in this town, is, is, is just being at the stand having, having some herring. I thought you were a little harsh about the mustard pots. They're, they're kind of cute. Um, I live in New York City, in Manhattan, and uh, on the 17th floor, and I wake up in the morning, and I look out and see a not unpleasant, a kind of a spectacular view of uh, high-rise buildings in Midtown. Um, but uh, I see nothing uh, uh, in nature. Uh, but the first thing I hear in the morning is birds singing. And I always think, where do they come from? And, and that's kind of how New Yorkers think. It's like as, as though we're on a separate planet that doesn't have nature. And, you know, how did nature get here? Um, <clears throat> I, I've often been fascinated by um, vacant lots in Manhattan. Uh, if you live near a vacant lot, uh, you will notice that uh, it looks very barren in the winter and then it starts to get green in the spring. By summer, it looks like a tropical rainforest. I mean, weeds have turned into 12-foot high trees and there are vines and uh, uh, just this uh, uh, thick, thick vegetation that's just running wild and out of control and you think, wow, what, uh, what's going on here? What is there something in the soil? And what, what was this place like uh, before we built completely over it? Um, fortunately, we have the answer to that because um, English and Dutch people uh, uh, who um, went to what is now New York uh, before it was at all built um, wrote various journals and accounts describing it. And they, describe a very beautiful place. Manhattan was an island of uh, ponds and trout streams, and there were uh, lynx, wildcats, elk, and deer, fox, and, um, and the rivers were um, full of uh, whales and dolphins and uh, all kinds of fish. There actually are still 200 species of uh, fish in the Hudson River, including things that no New Yorker ever thinks of as a New Yorker, like uh, seahorses. Seahorses swim by Manhattan in the Hudson River. Um, uh, and when Europeans first came to this spot, uh, uh, they were awed by what a beautiful place it was, and they all wrote this one thing about the sweetness of the air, the freshness. Uh, they said you rounded Sandy Hook and suddenly there was this smell, this sweet smell, and there was all this speculation about where did this great smell come from? Um, we'll never know, um, but it's, it's not there, I can, t I can assure you. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the Dutch um, noted uh, all of these species, all of that. They started giving numbers to uh, all these fish they had never seen. Um, uh, became fascinated with striped bass, which is a uniquely American uh, species. And uh, um, uh, it was written that uh, they, they decided it was an aphrodisiac, which, you know, uh, so this place was so rich that uh, 
uh, you had a choice of aphrodisiacs. Um, uh, Isaac de Rassier, uh, a, a New Amsterdam commercial agent, wrote of striped bass in 1620, it seems that this fish makes the Indians lascivious, for it is often observed that those who have caught any when they have gone fishing have given them on return to the women who look for them anxiously. As a lifelong striped bass fisherman, um, I hadn't known this. Um, at the bottom uh, of all of these waterways, and one of the things that New Yorkers have lost sight of is that New York is built on an estuary. It's the estuary of the Hudson River, and it's an extremely complicated waterway of tidal ponds and uh, uh, marshes and wetlands and uh, um, and like all wetlands, very environmentally rich and environmentally fragile. Uh, and at the bottom were oyster beds, absolutely everywhere, hundreds of miles of oyster beds. Um, and you could just walk to the, uh, the, the water's edge and pluck them and have yourself a meal. Um, and they were uh, said to be very large, uh, large as a plate, somebody said. Somebody else said uh, large as a woman's hand. Already they're getting a little smaller. Um, uh, they, they probably were extremely large uh, uh, because um, we're used to oysters that for economic reasons are harvested after two and a half or three years. And an oyster will live about 15 years. So if you have a 10-year-old oyster, it's going to be enormous. Um, everybody kept writing about how big New York oysters were, um, which could be good or bad. Uh, Thackeray, the British novelist, said that eating one was like eating a baby, <laughs> which I assume isn't an endorsement. Um, uh, it, it was something that the, the, uh, the Dutch people who lived here, of course, being oyster eaters, because the Dutch are oyster eaters, um, uh, were very happy you know, to discover this and with great excitement uh, told the Dutch West Indies uh, Company about the oysters and, and the, the, the Dutch West Indies Company being the kind of company it was immediately started drawing up contracts for who got the pearls. Um, there are no pearls in oysters. Uh, this is one of the great <coughs> misunderstandings of nature. Um, the animal that produces oysters, although it's, it's called the pearl oyster, is not an oyster. It's not uh, in the oyster family at all. It's more closely related to a mussel. And it can't digest celluloid, and it puts this chemical coating around it, which gradually turns into an oyster. The true oyster, which was what was in New York Harbor, uh, also can't digest celluloid, but it just spits it out. Um, and for centuries now, people continue to be looking for the pearls, <coughs> the pearls in these oysters, um, and they're not there. Um, but uh, the oysters themselves um, uh, turned into a valuable resource, uh, and as New York expanded as a harbor, as transportation improved, um, the oyster um, kept uh, becoming a, a, a more and more commercialized item so that um, uh, when the first um, uh, steamboat uh, run, this is Robert Fulton, another great misunderstanding. People say that Robert Fulton invented the steamboat or invented the steam engine. Actually, he didn't invent anything. What he did was he was the first person, he wasn't even the first person to uh, uh, create a uh, commercial run of a steamboat, but he was the first person to create a commercial run of a steamboat that made money, proving that steamboats were economically viable. And that first run was from New York City, from the East River to Albany, uh, and it carried oysters to the great delight of uh, people who lived in Albany. Um, and when the Erie Canal was built, which um, opened up uh, uh, it, it connected the Great Lakes to New York Harbor and, and meant that there was a waterway um, 
from New York City uh, uh, deep into the American West. Uh, uh, and you have to remember that uh, oysters are a very bulky sort of thing to trade. You know, trading in bulk means trading by water. Um, oysters uh, were one of the first products to be taken uh, through the Erie Canal and onto the Great Lakes and out west. And, and when railroads were built, um, they carried oysters to St. Louis and Chicago and Denver and uh, San Francisco. Uh, you can go into archives in these various western cities at the time uh, that the railroads opened in these towns and look in the newspapers and you will invariably see ads that say fresh New York oysters arriving. Um, it was a famous product. It was, um, it was what New York was known for. And as transatlantic transportation got uh, faster, it, it became known in Europe. They were shipped to, uh, uh, to England and to Germany. And uh, um, uh, if you had lived in the uh, 17th, 18th, or 19th century and uh, had said to a friend, I'm going to New York, they invariably would have said to you, uh, enjoy the oysters. Uh, it's what people did in New York. If you go back and you look at uh, writers who came to New York, Dickens, Jose Marti, you know, any writer, um, they wrote about the oysters. Um, uh, it became uh, a part of the culture of New York City. Um, they were sold on street corners uh, very commonly. On almost every street corner, there would be a stand where you could buy oysters. Um, you could get them at the markets, the open markets. You know, people talk with great nostalgia about how in Paris you used to be able to go late at night and get onion soup in Leal. Well, in New York City, um, you could go any time of night to the uh, Washington Market or the Fulton Market or any one of a variety of downtown markets any time of night and have uh, a dozen raw oysters or an oyster stew or some fried oysters. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, there were no bridges and ferries ran all night between Manhattan and Brooklyn and because the ferry created all-night traffic. Uh, there was a all-night business <coughs> for the markets. Um, and the, 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 the food, the, you know, the, 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 the munchy food that people ate while they did, went marketing was, uh, was oysters. Um, uh, they had a thing called oyster cellars, uh, cellar, C-E-L-L-A-R, uh, basements. Uh, basement, um, establishments that uh, um, served uh, a lot of liquor and oysters, usually in sort of bad parts of town, uh, very inexpensively, and uh, these places were frequented by um, uh, ladies of the night, uh, which was the other product that New York City was famous for. And um, uh, one of the interesting things about uh, this phenomenon of oyster eating in New York City was that it had no socioeconomic boundaries. It was the food of the poor and it was the food of the uh, wealthy. Uh, it was very unusual for rich people not to reject food that poor people eat. Uh, but if you went to a famous restaurant to a banquet, uh, um, they would serve oysters uh, exactly the same way as the oysters in the slums. Um, and they were incredibly cheap. There was something called the Canal Street Plan, which was all you could eat for six cents. You know, all you can eat is this weird, very American concept. I mean, you would think, you know, how many could you eat? But, uh, uh, people ate dozens and dozens of them. Um, there was a, um, uh, a, a crisis in, in New York when uh, the Erie Canal opened. Uh, and they, they wanted to have all these great celebrations in New York City for the opening of the Erie Canal. And they suddenly realized that, that they didn't have any appropriate restaurants for celebrations, that um, uh, you know, they just had all these sleazy oyster places. Um, and 
And then right around the time, there were lots of articles in the newspapers about how New York had no appropriate restaurants. Uh, I, I'm, I'm talking much worse than Amsterdam here. Uh, they, um, uh, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen if you're feeling insecure about your restaurants is to have a famous French person visit uh, the, the, the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, in 1825, made his first uh, visit since the revolution. He came to New York, and, and they wanted to take him around, and there was you know, no appropriate place for a French person, and, uh, although he didn't feel that way. Um, uh, and uh, a, a Swiss uh, family called the Delmonicos opened a, uh, the first French restaurant, and, and, and pretty soon, uh, a, a tradition which has lasted to this day in New York of uh, upscale restaurants being French um, started to uh, just sweep through Manhattan. Um, I just want to read you something from a uh, diary of Philip Hone. Philip Hone was, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about New York City history is that uh, the same characters keep showing up over and over again. Uh, and this is the, the, the self-made ex-mayor uh, who just sits around grumbling about everything after he's out of office. We have a few of them now. They're, they're always around in New York. Um, Philip Holm wrote in his diary in 1838, my wife, daughter, Margaret Jones, and I dined with Mr. and Mrs. Olmsted. The dinner was quite a la Francaise. The table, covered with confectionery and goo looked like one of those shops down Broadway in the Christmas holidays, but not an edible thing. The dishes were all handed round, in my opinion, a most unsatisfactory mode of proceeding in relationship to this important part of the business of a man's life. One does not know how to choose because you are ignorant of what is coming next or whether anything more is coming. Your conversation is interrupted every minute by greasy dishes thrust between your head and that of your neighbors. And it's more expensive than the old mode of shooing a handsome dinner to your guests and leaving them free to choose. It will not do. This French influence must be resisted. But it wasn't. Um, and uh, uh, the great French restaurants uh, we're known for their oysters, um, just like all the old lowbrow restaurants had been. Um, and uh, uh, th this, uh, this continued in, in, the, in the 19th century. Um, uh, uh, more and more oysters were sold, more and more oysters were exported, and more and more oysters were, were eaten locally. Um, and uh, it just became a New York obsession. Um, and, you know, I, I, I went through all these uh, back New York papers and I discovered that they constantly wrote about oysters. I mean, they must have had oyster correspondence. Uh, there were just constant articles about, I mean, if a new oyster bed was discovered somewhere in New York City waters, it, it was a front page story, and, and if uh, uh, beds were looking exhausted somewhere, that was a story, and, and, and they had um, editorials about oysters. Um, this one is from uh, Harper's Weekly Magazine in 1872, as you're going to learn some things you never knew. The delicious bivalve was familiar to the ancients. Their indulgence, however, never encouraged tyranny or degenerated into despotism, as did the love of peacock tongues. Nor, I, nor were they ever known to share the demoralizing tendency necessarily incident to the unrestrained consumption of pâté de foie gras. Um, I can't explain that. Uh, there were many uh, weird items like that. Um, uh, in, in the uh, 1880s, uh, what was called the Gilded Age, there, there was this period of tremendous uh, opulence. This was the age of robber barons, and uh, fortunes were made. Um, uh, 
and uh, there were something like 400 millionaires in the United States, and 300 of them lived in Manhattan, and the other 100 came to visit. Um, and they had these restaurants, um, and they called them lobster palaces. They were really, it would be more appropriate to call them oyster palaces, because they served more oysters than lobsters, but it would be a, a, a contradiction in terms because oysters weren't expensive. It, it didn't... It didn't denote luxury to say oyster. Uh, they'd go there and they'd eat, uh, you know, six dozen oysters before dinner, and then, you know, have a few steaks, a couple of pies, uh, just en enormous quantities of food. Um, this was a, a description of uh, of uh, somebody um, in, in dying in one of these restaurants. Uh, he lives very high, and when he comes to die, he does it so quickly that he actually interrupts himself in the midst of ordering another bottle. His color changes. If it was purple, he turns mauve. If cream-colored, a lovely shade of pale green. An attentive waiter catches him as he starts to flop over on the wine cooler. He has stopped ordering, so his friends know he must be dead. <laughs> um, the the The... Most famous of these people was a couple, uh, Diamond Jim Brady and Lillian Russell. Diamond Jim Brady was a, a native New Yorker who uh, made a fortune in selling railroad equipment. And uh, Lillian Russell was an actress who was said to be the most beautiful woman of her day. Uh, Oscar Cherky, who was a uh, maitre d', um, uh, described her, uh, he, he was just absolutely smitten with her. Um, when he, wait, he uh, waited on her, uh, he remembered her being, uh, uh, his, his description was, I, I remember the smooth flow of her blue gown, the exotic effect of her golden hair, but most of all, the bank down fire that smoldered in her beautiful face. She was the loveliest woman I had ever seen. Um, what he neglected to mention is that she probably weighed about 300 pounds, uh, you know, and it was all sort of tucked in here and bursting out here and uh, through the miracle of whalebone. And um, the two of them were known to go to restaurants and, and, and eat um, uh, just huge quantities of food, starting with dozens and dozens and dozens of oysters. Uh, they, they, ate, they didn't eat New York oysters, they ate Chesapeake oysters because they were larger. Um, and um, the this, this same Oscar Cherky uh, uh, said that the, the greatest disillusionment of his life was the, the first time he actually got to wait on them because they would dine in a private room that he'd see all this food going into. And when he finally got to wait on them, he discovered that um, Miss Russell ate everything and that Diamond Jim was actually a fairly moderate eater. Um, uh, th this, uh, th this kind of opulence um, uh, uh, kind of went hand in hand with the, uh, um, the oyster business. Uh, you know, more and more oysters, more and more money. Um, and... Uh, but there was this, there, there was this other thing um, that was going on, uh, and that was um, uh, there were uh, chronic um, uh, epidemics, um, and to explain, I, uh, to explain this, I, I just want to back up in history a, a little bit to what starts with a good Dutch story. Uh, when, when, when Peter Stuyvesant uh, came to New York to straighten things out for the West Indies Company, because it, you know, it just wasn't turning out to be the profitable place it should have been. And, and um, one of the things he did is he built a wall with slave labor, what today is called Wall Street, where today is Wall Street. And uh, <clears throat> the wall... Um, apparently was to keep the British out, although we're always taught in school it was to keep the Indians out, which might have made more sense, because why would the British, the world's greatest naval power, attack a, uh, an ocean port from the land? And in point of fact, they didn't, and the wall was useless. Um, 
But while the wall was up, um, the residents of New Amsterdam uh, developed this habit of taking all their trash and throwing it over the wall. Because uh, you see, you know, that's what people do with trash. They find a place where you can't see it, right? So you just toss it over the wall and it's gone. Um, uh, after the British took over and there was no use for the wall, they tore it down. Um, uh, there used to, above uh, Lower Manhattan, there used to be this beautiful pond where the Dutch used to like to have picnics. And the wall was torn down and suddenly the pond was just covered with garbage. You know, it was a disgusting place. Um, and uh, so there was you know, all this discussion of, you know, what do we do about this terrible place? And they say, well, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a foul place. Let's zone it for polluting industry. So it became where the slaughterhouses were and tanneries and, and it got really smelly and disease ridden and disgusting and uh, more discussions about we have to do something about this place. The pond uh, was called the Collect, uh, um, originally called the Calca, the Dutch for lime because of uh, oyster shells that were piled there. And um, uh, th there were all these discussions about, you know, cleaning up the collect and uh, the man who designed Washington wanted to turn it into a kind of aquatic park. And there were all of these ideas. But uh, the city of New York came up with the, um, the type of solution that the city of New York is still coming up with. They said, you know, let's just buy a bunch of dirt and fill it in and it'll be downtown real estate and it'll be worth a lot of money. So they did, they filled it in and, you know, it's hard to fill in a big pond and so it was still kind of muddy and mucky and, and still smelled bad and nobody wanted to live there. Um, so instead it became uh, the slum where the poorest immigrants lived um, called Five Points, an infamous slum. And... Uh, you know, and then for most of the 19th century, there were these discussions about what do we do about Five Points? Uh, and eventually Five Points was, was bulldozed down. And um, uh, I tell this story because this is emblematic for uh, uh, urban planning in New York City. This is the way it's done. Um, so there were these periodic uh, epidemics of cholera and typhoid. And uh, naturally, there was a lot of discussion about what caused them. And everybody was pretty sure that they knew that um, the cause of these diseases was uh, um, poor immigrants. Because, you know, people who are born in another country are necessarily dirty and disease-ridden. We all know this. And, uh, um, you know, there were many articles and discussions, and every time there was an epidemic, uh, uh, suddenly this turned into a discussion about the immigrant problem. And then, in 1855, there was a cholera outbreak, outbreak uh, that for some reason didn't uh, affect anyone in the slums, it didn't affect any immigrants, any poor people, and uh, several prominent citizens died. And this really shook up the New York establishment. And they said, well, you know, this didn't seem to come from immigrants. What could have caused this? And s somehow somebody said, you know, it must be the oyster beds. And uh, uh, it was called the oyster panic. And for a few weeks, nobody would eat oysters. Um, and, and then the uh, incidence of cholera went away and everybody forgot about it and they went back to blaming the immigrants for everything. Um, uh, but in fact, uh, they were exactly right in the uh, 18... 80s. Uh, well, in, in mid-century, Louis Pasteur said that, uh, you know, diseases are caused by uh, germs, and it was called the germ theory, but nobody could really prove it, and it was, you know, just something some French guy had thought of, and who cares. And um, in, the, in the 1880s and 1890s, German scientists started um, uh, discovering how these things worked and identifying the, 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 the bugs, and, and they got to the point where they could take a, uh, when there was an epidemic, they could trace it to its source. And its source always turned out to be an oyster bed. And then they would close that oyster bed. And there would be all these discussions in the newspaper of, isn't this terrible? And you know, if this continues, there won't be any more oysters. And oysters will turn into a luxury item. And um, all these discussions. Um, and this went on for more than 30 years. 
from when the first bed was closed in the uh, early 1890s till 1927 when the last bed um, off Staten Island was closed. Uh, and then there was no more, uh, it, it was over. Um, oysters at that point could still live in New York water, but you'd get really sick if you uh, um, ate them. And then the water, I, I mean, it, it was, this alone was a, a huge shock, even though it took 35 years, it somehow was a shock that it, that it was gone. Uh, just like strangely, it was a shock to learn, you know, that centuries of dumping raw sewage on your food supply was bad for your health. Um, and uh, you would think the reaction to this disaster would have been to clean up the water, but actually it got much worse uh, after the beds were closed. And the water got to the point where it looked like molten lava and it was just kind of bubbling up and gaseous and uh, oysters couldn't even uh, live in the water. Um, it, it has gotten cleaned up uh, because of the uh, something called the 1970 Clean Water Act which, uh, in which the federal government mandated the, the, uh, that all New York City waters be cleaned to the point where they were uh, swimmable and fishable. And uh, today they are swimmable and fishable but um, uh, uh, not edible, uh, because there's still PCBs and heavy metals in, in them. But oysters will um, live there again, and they're replanting these oysters. Uh, they're replanting these beds because oysters are very healthy for the water, but nobody uh, as of yet can, can eat the oysters. I, I just want to um, uh, finish by uh, just reading one quick paragraph. Um, Jonathan Swift famously commented on the courage of the unknown original gourmet who first popped a raw oyster into his or her mouth. It is hard to explain to those who don't do it by what strange impulse humans take these primitive creatures with their tiny hearts pounding. Yes, we eat oysters live, and if they're shucked properly, their hearts are still pounding, uh, and slide them down their throats. It certainly has been something New Yorkers did with passion. The best explanation is that a fresh oyster from a clean sea fills the palate with the taste of all the excitement and beauty, the essence of the ocean. If the water is not pure, that too can be tasted in the oyster. So if someday New Yorkers can once again wander into their estuary, pluck a bivalve and taste the estuary of the Hudson in all the freshness and sweetness that was once there, the cataclysm humans have unleashed on New York will have been at last undone. But that day is far off. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you have, you have a more upbeat assessment of Dutch food than... The than I, uh, oh, I, I thought you were pretty much on the money, except for that, you know, comment about the mustard pot I thought was unfair. <laughs> All right. Let me ask you a process question. You, uh, you, you get an idea, and ideas come from wherever they come from, and you, uh, it, it, it sits in the back of the mind for a while. Uh, for you, what brings it to the fore, what makes you decide, uh, I'm going to spend a year or two years or whatever working on this? Okay, this is the way it works. I, I, you know, I have ideas that I want to write about. Um, and then I look, and often for years, um, for a story. Because to me, um, storytelling is, is the only way I mean, other people can do other things, but I, I can't. It, it, to me, it has to be about storytelling. So, for example, for, for many years I had this idea, I would like to write something about New York and how it grew, how it grew as a commercial center and how it grew as a food center and, and how everything was done all wrong. And uh, um, uh, I actually realized about the oyster story because the New York Times asked me to write an article about it. And I, and I realized, you know, this is it. This, you, you know, you just tell the story of what happened to these oysters, and you have this whole story that I was trying to mm -hmm. tell. Um, 
and, and that's it. I always, I always look for something that's a, it has to be a good story, mm -hmm. and it has to be a story that, um, that means something. So you start with, you start in this case with something general, something large, New York and its development, but you don't want to take the, uh, there's no point in taking a standard textbook. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'll give you another example, um, uh, overfishing. You know, I, I think overfishing is a, is, a, is a very large issue that affects the whole uh, marine and land ecology of, of, of the planet. Mm -hmm. um, but it can be really deadly to write a book about overfishing. Um, and over a period of time, I realized uh, uh, a couple of things. One is that the cod, that is just the history of the cod, was an incredibly great story. Uh, and, and just like you really want in a good story, you know, it had a tragic ending. Mm -hmm. And the tragic ending, you know, the, the, the whole story really um, um, made the whole point about overfishing. Uh, and so I wrote uh, a book about overfishing. I, I think a lot of people don't even realize that it's a book about overfishing. <laughs> so, so that's one way that you, you start. Right. Uh, the, the, the next thing I was going to ask you was about, I mean, several of your books have been about a thing and looking, and, and you give at least the idea that you could take almost anything and look Look yeah. at it hard enough, and 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 you can see the world in it. Or see, I, I, you know. I I know I give that idea, and and, and uh, I have been accused uh, in various newspapers of being responsible for all sorts of terrible books that have, <laughs> have come out with this uh, be, because of this idea. I I never believed that that you could take anything and and necessarily make a good uh, book around it. it. It has to be a really great story. And it has to be, there has to be some reason why this story is, is important. And, and there has to be, um, I think there has to be something surprising about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could write a story about how oil is extremely valuable and people fight over it. Um, but uh, I don't think anybody would be very surprised by that. Right. Uh, so it wouldn't really uh, pull them in. Right. We, we know that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it helps to have that element to it also. Uh, cod and, and oysters, both of the, these are both stories about sea creatures, and, and both of them are tragedies in a sense. Um, what, where, do they, where do they differ in terms of where they end up? What happened to cod? What happened to oysters? Um, well, they're, they're, they're different in a few ways. As books, they're very different because um, uh, the oyster book is really about a microcosm that I intend for the reader to, you know, ex expand. It's about New York City, but it's really about all cities. Uh, so it's, it's, it's using New York City uh, as a way to talk about all cities uh, in general. Um, in my COD book, I talk about the entire Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a much broader kind of book in that, in that sense. Um, the, the issues are different, uh, uh, overfishing and, and pollution. Um, and, um, the, um, uh, and the main characters are different. <laughs> you know, a, a codfish and an oyster are... are uh, is one different. easier to write about than another, just as, yeah, a, Cod just, as a, a character? Yeah, Cod is a better character, you know? <laughs> they're, they're, they're sort of a bad guy. They're, 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 they're violent, and they eat everything mm -hmm. in sight, and they're bullyish. And, right. you know, Cod, oysters are they're, they're very nice. They just, they're, and dull, dull, mm -hmm. you know? They just <laughs> attach themselves somewhere and pump water in and out. <laughs> bad guys are just inherently more interesting, right. you know? Um, I don't. I don't mean to equate uh, a people or a, a culture with with things, but I mean you write about several several uh, items, several things, and then uh, you've also written books about the Basque people, about European Jewry, about the uh, cultures in the Caribbean. Uh, so one common theme there is. Uh, Things or or cultures that are struggling to survive. Survival, yeah. So, so what's this is? How, so, where, so, where does this fit in your in your makeup or the way you see things? Well, um, I mean, you're drawn you, to you tell those have, kinds you, of stories. You, you, I don't. You you may have found this also. You, you, um, 
uh, one of the things about being a writer is as you develop a body of work, you learn things about yourself yeah. because certain things just keep appearing over and over again and, and you, you didn't. Um, I, I find that very sort of interesting about myself that there is this constant theme of survival. Um, I guess this is something that concerns me a lot. I, I at the outset, didn't really know it, but you know, there it is. It just keeps <laughs> turning up. Uh, the Dutch were attracted to Manhattan because of, of the harbor, and those were also conditioned that the harbor was also, you might say, what attracted the oysters to, to, right. to Manhattan. Um, and so, the I mean, you, the story as you tell it is the is the story of how these two things both thrived there, the culture that, that grew up there and the oysters, and then how the one overwhelmed the other. Um, and you make the point several times in the book that, uh, that uh, the, 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 it, there's, I'm trying to think of the word that you use, but it's um, the culture, uh, the, the numbers of people overwhelm this pristine, this pristine uh, uh, area. And uh, on the one hand, that, that's true of New York, but it, it's true of many, if not most, cities. And what's the ultimate point then that, that cities should be built in places, in, in, cities should be built in deserts or? or, or? Um, no, what's the point? They just wreck the desert, you know? <laughs> um, uh, they have to be built differently. They have to be built, uh, I, I don't, accept the notion that a city is nece necessarily in uh, contradiction to nature. A city can be developed uh, uh, in harmony with nature. Mm -hmm. Now, if you develop a city in harmony with n nature, you may reach a point where um, you have to say, this place can't support any more people. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's, it's a little hard uh, to explain exactly how that mechanism would work, but if you had, uh, if cities were developed in an ecologically conscious way, um, somehow in the, in the normal flow of things, uh, they would only reach a certain population because they can't uh, support anymore. And I, I, you know, I think you could make an argument that there's too many people in New York, that, you know, there's, there's a limit to how many million people should be living on the estuary of a mm -hmm, river. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that applies to a lot of other places Absolutely. as well, obviously. Yeah. Um, when, when you're reading a book called The Big Oyster and you reach a section that begins, cholera is a disease caused by bacteria vibrio cholerae, you know that the, uh, the party is over. In, <laughs> in, right. in the 1880s, you say New York was producing 700 million oysters a year. Uh, talk about how rapid the decline was how, uh, and, and how people reacted to it. Well. Um, you know, what, the interesting thing that happened is that um, in the early 1800s, people started realizing that the oyster beds were uh, severely over-harvested and were in danger of being wiped out. And in fact, much earlier than that, I believe even going back to Dutch times, there were discussions. Yes, mm -hmm. there were some Dutch regulations trying mm -hmm. to control the harvest of oysters because uh, the beds were in danger of getting wiped out at some point, and um, um, they learned about cultivating oysters. Uh, the East River was actually uh, the um, first place in North America to farm oysters. Um, and because they learned how to farm oysters, they kind of beat this problem of over-harvesting. They um, as, as long as they could get enough seed, and sometimes there was a real scramble for seed, and they used to get seed from the, the Chesapeake. Um, you know, oysters are, um, are, are all about where you plant them. You know, all, all of the oysters in North America, from Louisiana around Florida, all the way up the coast to um, Newfoundland, are biologically identical, and yet they look different and taste different mm. because they're... Um, they're determined by the, the, the temperature of the water and the salinity and the type of food and um, a, a lot of environmental things. Um, uh, so that if you took a Chesapeake oyster, which is nothing like a New York oyster, and you took the seed and you planted it in a place in New York, uh, 
it would grow into the exact kind of oyster that had been there before, mm -hmm. because it's the conditions of the mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that create that. So, so there were, you know, it, was, it became penalty proof. You know, they, yeah, they could yeah, just, yeah. And, and I believe that that phenomena um, really contributed to the carelessness of the whole thing. You know, uh, we've beaten nature, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there's a lot in this that I don't understand. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, for a very long time in New York City, anybody who lived by a waterway never opened their windows because it smelled so bad. And, you know, wh why weren't people objecting to this more? Right. And why weren't people saying this is unhealthy? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. um, you know, wh why all of this was being accepted is kind of hard to explain. And it's kind of hard to explain why they spent 35 years um, shutting down one oyster bed after another till they were all gone mm -hmm. instead of at some point saying, you know, let's do something right, about this. Right. But um, I was recently teaching a fourth grade class in Brooklyn. And this fourth grade kid said to me, you know, you, you, the, the way you explain this and now they keep shutting them down and everybody talks about it and nobody does anything. Isn't this just like global warming? <laughs> uh, so what were you doing teaching a fourth grade class in Brooklyn? Um, somebody asked me to. Uh -huh. It was fun. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Uh, what was drinking oysters? It's not what it... Uh, uh, no. It's not <laughs> no. what you think. Drinking oysters, um, well, there's the good version and the bad version. The good version, uh, what the oyster producer would say is that drinking oysters was um, uh, uh, taking the oyster harvest and uh, 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 planting them in nearby... Uh, uh, fairly fresh water for a few days uh, and so that you could have a nice, plump, delicious, fat mm -hmm. oyster. Mm -hmm. um, what um, the New York Times said, I think correctly in the 19th century, is that uh, you, were, you, were, you were taking oysters and marinating them in the most polluted water in the city <laughs> and uh, uh, leaving them there, there for a few days and selling them by the pound uh, for uh, you know, with the extra weight that they had <laughs> they had put on by getting filled with all these polluted mm -hmm. waters, mm -hmm. uh, and it was eventually banned uh, as a practice. But it was a very common practice for a long time to just, in New York to just add uh, add to the, to the profit, right? To up the profit margin, right? Yeah. Um, is uh, is the experience of New York Harbor uh, worse in historically than other cities with harbors uh, in, in in terms of pollution of, of uh, um, wildlife, shellfish. Well, it's it's more dramatic in a way because there are very few cities that had a natural product like a natural mm -hmm. resource mm -hmm. like oysters mm -hmm. that they that was actually a major economic activity for as long you know into the yeah. 20th mm -hmm. century. I mean, in, from purely environmental. Uh, point of view, you, you could do a similar story about Boston and Boston Harbor, or Cleveland and Lake Erie, or you know, lots of um, you know, Rotterdam. I was going to say, I don't, I don't know if Rotterdam right. oysters are right. a big uh, treat. <laughs> right, um, uh, but um, you know, from a storytelling point yeah. of view, this yeah, this sure. You, you came at it that way, right. in fact. You right. came at it. Um, all right, let me switch gears and ask you a few questions about. Um, in, is is a raw bar okay? Can you still eat raw oysters? Are they are, are oysters almost all uh, 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 man or cultivated now? Are they are there still wild ones? Can you eat those? Um, I ask most, this for very selfish reasons. <laughs> um, most oysters are cultivated. Mm -hmm. There are still some wild oysters that are harvested. The difference between farmed oysters and farmed fish is that uh, um, when you farm fish. The fish live a very different life, and so uh, the texture, their, their muscle texture is different because their activities are different. Mm -hmm. They genetically change because of their life cycle, mm -hmm. and they eat a different kind of food, and they, you know, everything about them changes. But a, a, a farmed oyster lives the exact same life as a wild oyster. It's a, it's a result of living a very dull life. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um, and they eat the same food, mm -hmm. and, and, and they have the, you know, the, the, the same kind of exercise and activity, which is none, you know? <laughs> and, and, and so, um, uh, gastronomically, uh, there, there's, there's nothing. In, in, in fact, you could argue that, that cultivated oysters are better than wild oysters mm -hmm. because uh, 
wild oysters will sort of clump together and fight for space and suffocate each other and, and they tend to grow in weird irregular shapes mm -hmm. and you know when you order oysters you get a plate full of oysters that are sort of the same shape and size mm -hmm. that's a product of cultivation mm -hmm. and planting them evenly spaced and right so, so just and again this is for self okay reasons, so that's one one part of your okay, question yeah. but to the the uh, are are they safe to eat um Assuming the restaurant, you trust the restaurant. Well, that, that of course, is the big thing is, mm -hmm. is, you know, if you think the restaurant is a dubious place, right. don't eat any raw food there. Mm -hmm. Probably shouldn't eat there at all. Um, uh, oysters, uh, the important thing to understand is that we eat oysters alive. Uh, don't eat a dead oyster. Uh, oysters deteriorate very rapidly once they die. Um, uh, so, don't eat an oyster. You know, if you get a bunch of oysters and you're shucking them and, and one of them is like, oh, this is great, it's already open. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> Throw right. it out. Right. Um, uh, as, as long as they're, you know, tightly closed, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they should be alive. And, um, uh, you know, I eat a lot of oysters. I really like oysters. And in my entire life of eating oysters, I have only once eaten a bad oyster. Mm -hmm. um, not a pleasant experience. No. Uh, and and uh, when, so when they're cultivated, you said that they're, so much of how they grow and I guess how they taste depends on their environment. So when they're cultivated, they're cultivated in different uh, styles. Do you know about that? I mean, do they want cultivate, uh, you know, give a certain kind of conditions to an oyster so that it'll have a certain... Uh, to a certain degree, they do. Um, uh, and, and they even sometimes try to plant certain kinds of algaes to produce certain kinds of <coughs> tastes and even certain kinds of looks. Mm -hmm. You know, some people like greenish oysters, not the meat, the shell, you mm -hmm. know, that has mm -hmm. algae in it. And uh, um, uh, to a certain extent, you do that. Of course, you know, you can't profitably farm oysters if you're going to invest in things like changing the salinity or the water temperature. Right, right, right. Uh, but they, they do sometimes alter places by altering the, the, the food supply by placing uh, certain kinds of algae or things. Mm -hmm. in them. All right, the last question I'll ask and then we'll uh, open it up to a general conversation. Uh, did you get any help from the oyster bar at Grand Central Station? You mean, did they give me any You didn't oysters? go in and, and, and explain that you were going to work on a book about no, this topic? No, no. Un unfortunately, um, uh, the, the oyster bar is sort of out of the loop. It was, uh, uh, it was started uh, considerably after the last bed was closed. Right. And there was only, uh, when I was working on it, there was only one restaurant uh, left in New York City that dated back to the time of New York City oysters. And that was a place in downtown Brooklyn. And they went out of business while I was working on the book before I had a chance to go oh. over there. So. <laughs> Too bad. Uh, let's uh, uh, open it up. Uh, any questions? Yes, Tim. Romans. Yeah, um, uh, st oyster stew uh, is really kind of good. It's a, it's a kind of food that people don't eat much anymore. It is, it's, the oyster is stewed in, in, in cream with lots of butter. And, you know, it's, you, you, know, you put anything in cream and butter, it's not going to be bad. Um, uh, but very, very rich. Uh, you still do run across it every once in a while, but uh, not very often because people... Don't like that. I actually had oyster stew in uh, Connecticut recently, but uh, um, that kind of cooking is 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 fading. Pickled oysters are something that date back to, you know, pre-refrigeration, uh, pre um, when transportation was slow, and it was the only way of commercializing oysters was to uh, um, a pickling becomes a, a misunderstood word because. Uh, I'm not sure how this works in the Dutch language, but in the English language, it gets confused with pickles. Uh, I'm 
pickling uh, means curing in salt brine. Um, so they weren't, uh, you know, vinegary. They, they were just uh, uh, salted. Um, and I've never had pickled oysters. Uh, you don't see them around much anymore, and I, I suspect there's good reason for that. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I often include recipes in my books, and it's because I, I like recipes as artifacts, and I, I think your history is incomplete to talk about these foods and not, you know, show recipes if you, uh, uh, if you can. Um, you know, fortunately, most people have been pretty good about writing down recipes. The Romans left recipes. And, um, and I think that they're uh, important for the history. Um, I sometimes feel like I should put a warning in the book that I'm not really suggesting that you make these dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Romans. The, the Romans started a cult. He's begging to differ. Um, I don't recall. You know, I <laughs> really think it was the Romans. But, uh, <laughs> um, well, they didn't actually cultivate them in the sense uh, that we mean today. Uh, what they did was they took them from the estuary and uh, replanted them in other places that were conducive to uh, better growth. Um, uh, they hadn't really learned about how to um, uh, gather uh, these um, uh, spats, you know, these little things the size of fingernails that are free-floating and haven't attached yet. Uh, they, they, they took, you know, immature oysters and, and placed them somewhere else. That's what a baby oyster is, the little thing floating around? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, uh, interestingly, some of the um, uh, uh, fairly ancient uh, Mesoamericans uh, on the uh, Caribbean coast uh, did do real oyster cultivation, oh. did do spats and oh. get them attached to, to, attach to uh, ropes and sticks. And, uh -huh. But because nobody ever paid attention to that culture, nobody learned from it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Died out. Any other questions? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. He said, he said that you mentioned you, you used the word planting, and he's saying it doesn't have roots. It's not a it's not a plant. Is that, uh, uh, a no, it, it, it's um, it, it's just an expression that's used because um, oysters attach themselves. They don't. Uh, they're they're not free moving animals. They they pick a spot and they attach to it, so it's likened to taking root like a plant. That's I'm sorry. They procreate. they procreate. I think he's asking the the question: How do they do it? Oh, how how how, how do oysters do it? <laughs> um, it, it, it actually. Um, uh, it, it just depends on the variety of oyster. The, the uh, European flat oyster, uh, which was the, uh, the original indigenous oyster in, uh, in Holland and uh, Belgium and northern France, um, which I don't know what you call it, but it's still around here. Uh, it's that round oyster, the very round one. Um, Anybody know? It's, um, it's a different... Um, it's a, it's a different genus and species. Uh, it's a genus Australia rather than uh, Crassitrea, and uh, it reproduces by um, uh, the, 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 the male uh, releases sperm into the water, and the female collects it and holds it and develops the, the, the young. Um, the Crassitreus oyster, which is pretty much taking over because it's a, a more durable. I mean, if you consider that the range of the, of the Australia oyster is from uh, uh, northern Holland to the Brittany Peninsula, and the range of the Crassitreus is from South Florida to Newfoundland, you see that it's a, it's a much more uh, durable oyster that uh, lives in a lot of different climates. It also um, 
uh, is in fresher water, so it can be cultivated more inland. Uh, and it, uh, it, it cultivates by, you know, the female shoots out the egg and the male shoots out the sperm and, you know, they, they meet in the water and fall uh -huh. in love. And <laughs> yeah. When, when did the myth start? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it started with the Romans, I believe, or at least that's the earliest... Uh, record of it. The Romans, uh, it, it was the food of Roman orgies in the first century. Um, um, and, and it's just been around ever since, you know, um, um, Casanova was said to eat a lot of oysters and, you know, um, uh, Byron wrote of Don Juan eating oysters and, um, you know, then you get into these weird French concepts of aphrodisiacs, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you know, it was said that um, uh, uh, Rousseau and Diderot um, ate a lot of oysters to get inspiration. You know, I think, wow, you know, you, you eat an aphrodisiac to improve your <laughs> philosophical musings. That's, that, that is the most French concept <laughs> I've ever heard of. <laughs> um, you know, and there were, there were all these legends of Napoleon eating lots of oysters before he went into battle. Um, grotesque misuse of an aphrodisiac. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, yes, it's, it's why the oyster cellars were places where you went and ate a lot of oysters and also connected with prostitutes. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yes. How did they get to our? Well, oysters are, are mostly um, uh, cultivated, and they're um, uh, in most one kind of oyster or another in, in in most of the coastlines of the world. I mean, there are even tropical oysters and mangrove oysters and. Uh, um, they're in, you know, all of the continents, and uh, it's a it's a very global phenomenon. Oysters. Uh, um, How big of a business is it? I guess it, it depends. In in some places, it's very big business. Um, uh, I'm I'm not sure what the business is like in in, in Holland, in 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 France. It's uh, fairly small producers, often family producers, uh, although there are a few big corporate producers, uh, very regulated by uh, the French government in certain beds like uh, Arcachon. Um, in the United States, it is more and more a business that sort of uh, rugged individualists get into and just start a little oyster company on some cove somewhere. Uh, which is why there are more and more varieties of North American oysters because there's all these little startup oh, companies. So it's kind of like starting a winery. Or yes, exactly. Very much like a winery, oh, interesting. actually. Interesting. Hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Um, well, uh, there were a couple of things. Uh, one thing was that, you know, like most people, I tended to think of oysters as, as kind of fragile and um, didn't imagine that you could do things like throw them on boxcars and ship them to San Francisco and ship them across the Atlantic. And, and it, uh, I've come to realize that oysters are actually extremely durable, that uh, if you store them right, with it. They have a flat side and a cup side, and if you keep the cup side down so the liquid stays in it mm. and, you, and, 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 and they're shut, you actually have to scare an oyster to keep it shut. <laughs> oh, is that right? Uh, yeah. And they're, so they're, people, there are scarers, or how do they do uh, that? Yeah, well, they, the old New York way of doing it used to be, of course, this doesn't come up very much anymore because they fly them in, and right, so it doesn't okay, take yeah. that much time. But the old New York way of doing it is they used to... Uh, um, sort of slowly move them closer to the shore every day so they spent a little more time out of the water till they realized it was really bad out of the water and they just, when, when, when oysters are um, um, not feeling good about their surroundings, they tend to clamp up. So mm -hmm. you would just, you know, you do that for a few days and they 
just don't want any part of the world and they clamp up. The French actually would take an iron bar and go around and tap them. Yeah. <laughs> and they, when they tap them, they would, no, they would scare them, yeah. yeah. And, and, then, and then they'll stay clamped for a good long time. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the other thing uh, that really uh, fascinated me was that when the Europeans first came <clears throat> to uh, New York Harbor, um, they discovered uh, not only that the, the, the local people, the Lenny Lenape, were, were uh, eating a lot of oysters, but they had left these huge piles of oyster shells, some of which are still around, and one of which has been carbon dated to something like 6,900 BC. So people have been eating oysters in this spot for a very long time. And what's fascinating to me about this is that these are hunter-gatherers, what we think of as primitive societies. Um, and you think of these people as being very pragmatic and survival-oriented. And, you know, if you want some food to eat, you can get a lot of protein by, I mean, there were elk in Manhattan and deer and all of these large fish. And why would you be messing around with these oysters that, you know, aren't very nutritious and, and they have these big shells and they're, you know, just really impossible to get open, especially since they didn't have any knives. So we, we're not even sure how they opened them. Um, and, uh, you know, why were they dealing with this? And they were apparently dealing with it in huge quantities. And so the, the only explanation for that that I can come up with is that they were eating oysters for the same reason we do, uh, that they were a delicacy that they really liked. So, you know, that was a, really, a real revelation to me that hunter-gatherers had gourmet delicacies. <laughs> and you say they're not very nutritious. Uh, no, not not compared to uh, you know game or uh, you know a good uh, a, a lot of protein, a, a big striped a, bass or yeah, a codfish yeah, or yeah. something. Also, it's labor intensive. Yeah, to say the least. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Is if there's anybody here who's a semi expert in Dutch oysters and wants to give us a little uh, primer, please do. Otherwise, um, I'll just say thank you very much, Mark. This has been a, a lot of fun, and thank you all, too. Thank you. You did that wonderfully. Thank you, Mr. Kernansky, for your lecture tonight, and thank you, Russell Shorto, for the interesting conversation. I also would like to thank uh, Ambo Antos Publishers. Thanks also Odeon for the venue, and of course, Thanks to all our volunteers who helped out tonight. Um, for now, I would like to let you know about some very exciting events coming up. We will have Madeleine Albright uh, on the 17th of June. You can see it over there. And we will have John Irving. He will come to The Hague on the 24th of June. So I hope you will be able to join us. Um, for more information about our institute, please have a look at our website. Um, that's at uh, www.john-adams.nl or you can walk over there and have a look at our information stand. Um, and we would be delighted to welcome you as a member of our institute. Mr. Kurlansky will sign his books here right on stage and you can get a copy over there at the, at the bookseller. Um, and you're also welcome to have a drink over there in the bar, but we don't have oysters tonight. I'm very sorry. <laughs> so you have to buy them maybe tomorrow evening. Um, thank you for supporting the John Adams Institute, and I hope to welcome you again at one of our upcoming lectures. Thank you very much. <laughs>